Christmas Eve service was just incredible. If you were here, you know that. It was just great to be with everybody on Christmas Eve, and hopefully your Christmas day was just awesome. Just have 364 more days to go, right? <laughs> you just got done with it. But if you're like me, some of you might be like me. There was a long, uh, long time that I worked like a retail job, and so we had Christmas Day, Christmas. We had Christmas in January, Christmas. We had Christmas later in January, Christmas, because we'd have to go. If that's you, we will pray for you right now for blessings for more of your travel. But we're going to talk a little bit about community today, and it was so great to see all the community that we had. I mean, this place was packed. It was packed Christmas Eve. It was just so great. Um, we're going to be ramping up some of our small groups coming up in the spring, and so we're going to talk about community. And I know there are some people that won't admit this, but I really do believe that people long to connect with each other to have that connection with other people, whether it's family, friends, uh, people in this building, you know, other Christians. And one of the ways that we like to do this is to connect, is to gather with other people and other believers, you know, to be with like-minded people. And some of you might be thinking, you know, yeah, I don't really, I'd rather just gather with my nine cats, you know, sitting on my bed, watching Netflix, and and I get that. Right? Anytime I get invited to somewhere, there's going to be more than two people. You know, every day leading up, there's a little more and more dread happening. You know, my wife can attest to that, right? And it's just, it's just my nature. But at the same time, when I get done, I'm like, well, that wasn't so bad. You know, I got to talk to some people I haven't spoken to in a while. And then I'm, but then I'm wiped out afterwards. I go home and I'm just like, oh, man, it just drains it out of me, right? But it's great, you know, getting uh, together with people. But Finding and enjoying, and enjoying community has really been a struggle these past couple of years, right? I mean, it just really has. And sometimes you have to make do with what you have, you know? Sometimes, and I'm, I get it, some people have legitimate reasons they can't get together, you know? Some people just can't afford to get sick or let somebody else get sick. I mean, I've lost family members in just the past few months, and we understand that. But we do what we can, right, to have community. So this is not one of these, if you're not gathering together every week, God's going to smite you down, you know, smite you down or anything like that. We all have different levels of comfort during this time, you know. You might feel comfortable sitting six feet apart, you know, wearing your mask, and that's fine. I get it. You know, if you're like me, I ate buffet just a few days ago. You know, did you know those still exist? But they do, right? Everybody's sharing the same spoons. They're supposed to have gloves out for everybody. The gloves were gone, you know. It was a little, just a little place down in Salemburg, North Carolina, where they're just like, ah, whatever, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but, you know, they actually exist. But being involved in a community of believers is something that should bring us joy. And so today we're going to be looking at three keys to us having joy of community. So joy of community. So if you turn to your Bibles or open up your favorite app, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Philippians 1, verse 1, if you'd like to sync up, we'll be in the NIV, and a welcome to you at home. Thank you for being with us today if you're watching online. So Philippians chapter 1, starting right in verse 1. All right, here we go. So Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
Let's pray. Oh, Father God, again, we just thank you for your word this morning, Lord. We thank you for your presence. And we just pray that your word just penetrates our hearts and minds this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first key to the joy of community is this. Being on each other's minds. Being on each other's minds. So there's specific ways that we should probably think of one another, right? So if we look closely at verses uh, 3 through 6, we see that in verse 3, Paul thought of his brothers and sisters thankfully. He was thankful for them. When they came to mind, he just he thanked God for them. And as you see, I have someone here at the potter's hands. If you think of the people in this room, you know, even though maybe they got on your nerves a little bit last week, it's okay. Just still be thankful for them, thankful that they're here. And in verse 4, Paul thought of them prayerfully, and he thought of them joyfully. They brought a smile to his face. You know, so when that person comes to your mind, you know, you pray for them and be joyful that you have people here to share the experience of being a child of God with. And in verse 5, Paul thought of them spiritually. He, they were all spiritual partners in and for God's kingdom. So they weren't just this flesh, he didn't think of them just as like this flesh and bone kind of thing, right? He had this eternal perspective as he thought of them, you know, and as children and brothers and sisters of God. In verse 6, Paul thought, uh, he thought of them confidently. Now that's unusual, but what does that mean? Well, if we look at what Paul says, he says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. You see, Paul had confidence that they would mature in the relationship with Jesus and with the Father. So what do we see when we look around this room? Do we see each other as maturing Christians? Or do we get frustrated when we think about people that we believe are not as mature as Christians as we think we are? And isn't it a little bit ironic that if you think about somebody in that way, then probably you need a little bit maturing in your heart, right? Right? And so let's not just stop for the people in this room. What if we go beyond these walls of the potter's hand, right? How often do you think about those Christians that go to that other church down the road with all the multi-campuses and those kinds of things, multi-services? Do we pray for community and unity with our local churches, or do we let our competitive nature get in the way? Do we want to see hope and Unity Church and Cross Point or any of those other biblically sound churches succeed in reaching others for Jesus? Or are we secretly jealous when we see that they have all these other people coming or they have a bigger facility than we do? Do we focus too much on our differences with these churches rather than a, a unified belief in Jesus and the mission and purpose of the church, the big C? Right? So as we consider how we should think of others, thankfully, prayerfully, joyfully, spiritually, and confidently, let's ask ourselves how often we think of each other in these ways, here in this room and other Christians that we know of. And maybe that's easy for some of you. Maybe some of you have a lot going on right now, though, and it's difficult. You know, maybe you have a lot of noise in your head, especially this time of year, and it's hard to think about others. It's hard to push that noise out of your head. So at the end of this message, we're going to have a practical way, a practical exercise that you can start really focusing on others, and we're going to get to that later. But for now, let's ask ourselves, how do we really think of each other? And you, may not, you may have to dig deep. You may have a blind spot. You know, I didn't realize this, but 10 years ago, I figured out I had a problem with jealousy. I was really jealous of me. I was reading a book by Andy Stanley. It's called Enemies of the Heart. And he starts talking about this jelly and I'm th jealousy, and I'm thumbing through. I'm like, man, I had no idea. You know, I hate to admit it, but I will. It was hard for me to see people succeed that was, you know, that, you know other, even like other churches. I've been working with churches for a long time now, and I had this just problem with jealousy. So maybe you have this blind spot. So unfortunately, many of us have a difficult time having others' best interests on our minds, right? It's easy to be selfish, you know? It's easy to just think about your, yourself, but so we gotta be intentional. So we're gonna break it down. We need to think of our young people here, right? As you see them walk along, 
on Sunday mornings, you know, as you see them and they're gathering together, they're arm wrestling in the youth room. I don't know if, if you've ever been by our youth room, you see that weird looking table in there. That's an arm wrestling table, you know. We got Rocky Music, well, not Rocky Music. What's the name of that movie? Over the top music going on, you know. But we need to, we need to pray for them. We need to be thankful for their energy. We need to be thankful for the, that spark that they have. You know, we have to be thankful for the strong backs that they still have, you know, when we're moving stuff around, you know. And then our elderly. Let's go to the other spectrum, you know. Unfortunately, sometimes we can think of our elderly as like out of touch with what's going on. But we need to remember that there is wisdom there. That they have lived lives. They have seen things that hopefully we may, ne we may never see and they have that wisdom. And so when somebody comes up to you that has a little more gray hair than you do, at least uh, listen up and maybe keep an open heart and an open mind to what they have to say. We need to think of our sick. Maybe there are people that can only watch online right now. And that's why we, our online ministry is so important. And we work hard to try to keep it going and, and reach people online. Or maybe God has put it on your heart to go visit someone. And I know it probably would be hard. It, you know, it's kind of a difficult. It's like, oh, it's going to be awkward and uncomfortable. But, you know, pray for God to give you the courage to do those things that he puts on your heart. And what about our ministry leaders here? Are we praying for them, calling over the youth, our kids ministry uh, leaders that we have, our servant leadership team? So are we quick to judge what they're doing, or are we praying for them? If we have a concern about what's happening, are we going to the person and asking questions, or are we just assuming that we know, and then we just start spreading gossip behind their backs? And then finally, are people that are struggling spiritually? Are we walking next to them, right? Or we need, maybe we need to help carry their load for a little while, you know? There's a lot of stuff going on, especially in these, uh, these last couple of years. Let's, let's walk up to people and, and help them out. Maybe pray, God, help me to see and think of others as you do. Let me see them with your eyes. God, show me how I can best help this person. Show me how I can best love this person. Lord, put on my heart what you would have me do for them today. And so now the second key to the joy of community is similar to the first but even takes it one more step, and that's being in each other's heart. Being in each other's heart. Not on, but in. So what does that mean for us? Look at verses 7 and 8 again. It says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So is there this bond that we have with Christians? I had a pastor uh, explain it, you know, you, where hearts are woven or they're, or they're knit together. You know, in this room, we, sometimes you might not even understand that it's happening, but God puts our hearts together. And it, sometimes it creates these unexpected relationships that just kind of seem to come out of nowhere. And then you look back, it's like, wow, look at that. A few years ago, when we first moved back up to North Carolina to help plant a church, we were meeting in a school. And I was standing in the hallway, and I was there to help with the worship and everything. And um, I, don't, it might have, I don't remember what it was for, but we were having one of our gatherings to talk about how we were going to you know, start the church and everything. I'm standing there against the wall, and I just, I just have this vivid memory of this Big Italian man walking up to me and saying, hey, I can't do his accent. I'm sorry. I'm not even going to try. He said, hey, I heard you're looking for musicians. I play bass. And you might be thinking, who is that? Well, there's a guy playing bass up here right now, right? This, so, and it, we've been friends for that long, you know, since like 2013, you know, this this guy from a one-stoplight town in Steadman, North Carolina, and this other guy from Brooklyn. It's like, what do we have in common, right? I mean, seriously. But we have Jesus in common, and he's become one of my best friends. 
And so you might have these kind of unexpected relationships with other people, people you would have no reason to have anything in common with them. So in verse 7, this is the figurative use of heart. And it refers to the whole personality. It refers to the intellect, the emotions, and the will. So we begin to find ourselves in sync of how we think and what we think about, spurring each other on to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. Yes, the answer is always Jesus. And then we start sharing happy times and sad times. We laugh together and we cry together. And as God's will more and more becomes our will, we become unified on the best approach to reaching our community and our world for Jesus Christ. So Paul and the Philippians, they had this genuine love for each other that came from their whole being. And it was a kind of love that could only come from the Holy Spirit living in and through them and knitting their hearts together. And even though miles separated them at some times, Paul viewed the relationship as intimate. Why? Because they share their salvation and being sons and daughters of God. And in turn, they shared their calling to share the good news of Jesus with others. The Philippians had been in prison with Paul in spirit. And they had been willing to associate with and minister to him in prison. And so Paul shared in the grace of God with them. The words you share with me in, in the NIV, in the Greek, it means fellow partners or a partaker with. Paul and the Philippians were fellow partners of the enabling grace that God provides for his children. So what does that mean for us today? We have a partnership with each other here in this room and with other Christians in our community. In Apex, Holly Springs, Cary, you know, we are community which means we share this common unity, which is Jesus, right? It's not the style of music. It's not the style of preaching. It's not having a ball pit in the kids' room, right? It's Jesus. And so they loved each other with the love of Christ, and so should we. And so what does that mean to love someone with the love of Christ? It means loving like Jesus means we love sacrificially. We hold everything that we have with loose hands. We are willing to part with our time and our money and our possessions in order to serve other people. We recognize that all we have is a loan from the Father in heaven, and we are the ones responsible for what we do with it. And so we give people what they need when it is within our power to do so, joyfully, joyfully. So when we see a brother or sister in need, and we have those resources, whether it's time, whether it's money, whatever it may be, and we are to share what we have with them. To love like Jesus also means we cannot be selective in how we treat people. James chapter 2, verse 9 strongly condemns favoritism based on financial or social status. It says this, but if you show favoritism, your sin, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. But there is a flip side to this. There's another side of that coin. So we shouldn't expect a church to make decisions that line up with our preferences based solely on how much we give or our status in society either. So we need to think of it that way as well. We need to remain humble. And it's a, uh, one of the marks of a mature believer. So we are to treat every human being with dignity and respect. Every human being with dignity and respect, whether they're on the left or whether they're on the right, every human being with dignity and respect, because we need to remember that this person is a special creation designed in the image of God, that God loves them too. Sometimes that's hard to remember, right? So we must work to rid our hearts of racial prejudice, socioeconomic snobbery, and religious superiority. None of that belongs in the life of someone who wants to love the way that Jesus loves. However, there's a but here. We must not equate love with complete acceptance of everything someone does. That's not really true love. 
If you have kids, you know that, right? You're not going to let them pull the TV down on top of their heads. You're going to go, wait, <laughs> right? If you really love them, you know, so loving like Jesus means we care enough about the souls of others to tell them the truth. Jesus did not tolerate sin, deception, or false followers. We do not love people by watering down the gospel that could save them. Say that again. We do not love people by watering down the gospel that could save them. That is not love. Jesus never changed the truth to satisfy the whims of the listeners. He loved them enough to warn them. He loved them enough to challenge them. He loved them enough to teach them and then forgive them all the way to the cross. And so lastly, to love like Jesus means that we forgive like Jesus. Forgive when we have been wronged. See, our selfishness wants us to hang on to that wound some rot sometimes, right? And pet it and love it, you know, cherishing it, you know, and sometimes even reliving it in our minds. And that doesn't do us any good, you know, to go back to those feelings. Because Jesus forgave, and he tells us to forgive as well. And the reason that's important is because we cannot love someone that we won't forgive. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean to let somebody to continue to walk all over you, right? But we should forgive. We should forgive the wrongs. And when we forgive, it's then we can love and pray for that person with a clean conscience because we have done what God commands us to do. And that brings us to our third key to the joy of community, and that is, the, is being in each other's prayers. And he says this in verse 9, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So notice what Paul did not pray for. He did not pray for their material blessings. He didn't even pray for their physical health. Paul's prayer was for spiritual maturity, more knowledge of God and more knowledge of his word, for more discernment, to make wise choices, make wise decisions, to avoid evil and avoid sin, and for them to not just reject the false, but to hold on to the truth of Jesus, and that they would live according to sound and healthy teaching and that they would be filled with righteousness and bearing godly fruit in their daily lives. And his prayer was also for abounding love, to not only love God, but for them to accept God's love for them. And sometimes that's the most difficult thing for us to do. If we've been hurt time and time again in our lives, maybe you had a parent that didn't quite love you the way you think they should have. And so it's hard for you. You know, we got to remember we have a perfect heavenly father. He's not like that father you had that you grew up with. Or maybe the father that was absent from your life. Or maybe even the abusive mother that you had. He is not that way. He is your perfect father. And so we have to accept that love for him. And sometimes as Christians we have to say, Heavenly Father, I accept your love right now. And then that love is like a stream and it flows from the Father and then it pours out to others, right? And it's a love that loves others as you love yourself. And it's a sacrificial love that puts others' needs ahead of our own. So what if we pray for each other that way every day for that spiritual maturity and that abounding love? What if we thought of people and just... And just pray, Lord, Lord, I just pray for your abounding love in their life today. For people in this room, for people who can only watch online. I challenge you to go today. Look on Facebook. Look on YouTube. Look at the people who, are, who have been watching online. Some of them, that's all they've been able to do. Reach out to them. You know? Say, hey, we really miss you. I understand that you can't join us. But I just want you to know I love you and that we miss you. And the great thing about prayer 
is that it doesn't just change the other people, right, that person you're praying for. It can also change your heart towards that person. So if you're having a difficult time with someone, start praying for them. It's hard at first, right? Somebody that's kind of gotten on your nerves or done something, maybe even did you wrong a couple of times, start praying for them. You're going to find that God's going to soften your heart as well. That maybe that there was something in, your, in their lives that you don't even know about, right? They could be going through a lot of stuff, you know? And, they, and you just don't know that it's going on, and God's going to soften your heart so that you can reach out to them and so that we can give each other the grace that God has given us. So if you see someone coming in here week after week, maybe they got that thing right between their eyebrows, right? Right there, that little crunched up thing. You see them week after week and you're like, man, what's wrong with them? They're Christians. Why aren't they smiling? Maybe they're hurt. Maybe they've been going through a lot. You know? So instead of judging them, maybe we should walk next to them. Walk up to them. Hey, I've noticed, you know, these past couple of weeks, you know, you've just been coming in and you just look like you just got the weight of the world on your shoulders and maybe they do say can I, you know and the simplest thing you could do is can i pray for you right now can we just pray because they might not want to share what's going on so let's lift them up let's encourage them let's be an encouragement to others let's take back the joy of community and it's a community based on thankfulness and prayer confidence in each other and service and serving one another and then loving one another. That sacrificial love. And it's centered around Jesus and it's led by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Satan loves to break down and tear apart that common unity that we have. But I do believe that it's worth fighting for. And it's a spiritual battle, right? Our fight for something like this starts on our knees, right? It starts with prayer. And so let's pray for each other. So we're going to close a little differently today. I'd ask everybody to stand. And today we're going to ask God to help us pick four. We're going to pick four people. This is what I was talking about earlier, um, this practical thing that we can do to help. And we're going to pick four people to pray for this week for seven days. You can do it. You can remember, put a reminder on your phone, put an alarm, whatever you have to do. You can go old school, you know, a little thread around your finger. Whatever you have to do, pick four people. It can be somebody in this room. It can be a family member. It can be somebody, a neighbor that you know that doesn't know Jesus. But just start with four. Don't overwhelm yourself, especially if this is new. Write it down in a journal. Put it somewhere. So let's close our eyes right now, and we're going to pray. And we're going to ask God, Father God, Lord, we pray, Lord, to put four people on our hearts this morning. Lord, that need your love. Lord, we pray for the community that we have here at Potter's Hand and for the other Christians that we have in Apex and the surrounding areas, Lord. We pray for them this morning. Lord, put on our hearts what you would have us to do for these four people. How we should bless them. In what ways can we love them? Lord, we just, we give you all the praise this morning. Lord, we just so thankful for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.